Welcome to the C language programming course. In this course you will find all the fundamentals of C language and of programming in general, with a lot of examples, animations, illustrations, captions, pieces of code, etc. What I want you to know is that after almost each lecture, you will find a related quiz that I really want you to do and most importantly, read the explanation of each answer. Second thing is that I really want you to practice during this course, to better grasp the programming concepts we're gonna see. So don't hesitate to try your own code or to modify the one I show and see what happens when you try the program. It's a very good way to learn. So get ready to start learning programming and enroll in the course if you didn't yet. See you in the first lecture. Welcome to this video where we will set up our work environment. To write code you can use Notepad but it's better to have a text editor. It helps a lot. We need also a compiler that will transform our code into machine code. So to have these two elements, we will download what we call an IDE, Integrated Development Environment. It's a software where we will be able to write code and compile it to see the result. The one we're gonna use is CodeBlocks. It's a free IDE that you can download from the official website, codeblocks.org. I'll put the link in description. When clicking on the link, this web page will appear. And here it depends on your operating system. If you have Windows, click on this version. Click on FOSHUB of MeanGWSetup.exe. Then the download will start automatically, as you can see. After ending the download and opening the IDE, you will get this. At the middle you have the part where you will write code. At the left the workspace where you can put your project's files for example. At the top you have all the software related features, for example to save your projects, to compile, etc. And at the bottom you have the logs. Here you will for example find information about your program execution, for example the errors. In the next video we will create a C language file to start working. See you there. Welcome to this video where we will create a C file to start working. So here we are on our IDE code blocks and we want to create a file to start working. For that you click on create a new project, then this box will appear and you select console application, then you click on go, then you click next. Then you choose C language and not C++ and you click next. After it give a title to your project, the one you want, for example main. And choose the location in your PC where you want it to be saved, to be able to find it later easily. You can put it in the desktop for example. Then you click on next and you tick these two marks. For the compiler choose GNU GCC compiler if it's not chosen yet. Then click on finish. Congratulations you got your C file. It's in the workspace. The workspace is at left. The workspace is at left of the screen. There you have your project. When you double click on it, you find a folder called sources. You double click on it to find your C file, main point C. You double click on it, and tadam, here is your file appearing. It comes with some code. It's a basic program that we will analyze in the next video. You can zoom and dezoom by pressing Ctrl on your keyboard and the scroll wheel of your mouse. And when you're writing code and you want to execute it, you have to compile it. You can do that by pressing on this button. You can also do it by pressing F9 on your keyboard. Then if the compilation is done successfully, your program will learn on the console as you can see, this black box. See you in the next video to create our first program. Welcome to this video where we will create our first program in C language. As said in the last video, when we create a new project in CodeBlocks, it comes with a basic program already written. It's just a basic program that displays Hello World on the screen. Let's analyze it. Even if there is a bunch of new elements for you, don't worry about it. First we have the two include instructions. Here we are just adding what we call header files to our program. These ones contain ready functions that we will need later. Then we have the main function. This one will contain our instructions. We write int, main, then empty parentheses. It must be present in each program. Otherwise, the program wouldn't run. So we will need the main function in our program, and inside it we write the instructions that we want them to be executed. The body of the main function is between curly brackets. Don't forget them. And now, inside the main function, we can put instructions. In this simple program, we will just display hello world on the screen. For that, we use printf function and we write our text between quotes like this. The backslash n at the end is just to go to the new line. And by the way, printf is available in stdio.h. 
the header we included at the top. I told you that we will need it later. And after it, we have an important thing, the semicolon. Almost each instruction must end with the semicolon, so don't forget it. And the last thing in this program is return zero. This one tells the system that the program has been executed successfully. You aren't really obliged to write it, but it's good to know. And by this way, our program is ready to be compiled. For that, you can press on this button build and run. Or you can press F9 on your keyboard. And this is the result. It just displayed hello world on the console. Congratulations, it's your first program. Even if it's not that much, but you have to be proud of it. Don't get confused with all these new concepts like headers, functions, instructions, etc. You will have enough time to understand them all. Just don't give up and follow well this course. See you in the next videos. Now let's enter in the serious things. Welcome to this chapter about variables and data types. One of the most fundamental things in programming is variables. So what is a variable? A variable is a storage location used to store a value. So we use a variable when we want to save a value in memory to use it later for example. Imagine a variable as a box, where we can store something, and each variable has an address in the memory to know where it is located, a data type, because it, it can be an integer, a float, a character, etc., a name, and a value. Now let's see what are the different available data types in the C language in the next video. Welcome to this video where we will talk about data types. A variable can be an integer, a real number, a character, etc. This is why we have to precise its data type. So let's see the different data types in C language. If we want to store an integer, we have many choices. We have char, inside char, short int, inside short int, int, inside int, long int, inside long int, long long int, and inside long long int. Each one has its own value range and memory size that you can find in this table, link is in description. But don't worry, you don't have to know them all now because the one that you will often use is the int type. The int type size depends on the type of machine you're using, but if you assume that you're using a 64-bit machine, then the int type occupies 4 bytes in memory. One byte is 8 bits, so it occupies 32 bits in memory. So we can store an integer between minus 2 exponent 31, which is this number, and 2 exponent 31 minus 1, which is this number. We can also store a real number in memory. For that, we have three data types. We have the flow data type, which occupies 4 bytes in memory, the double data type, which occupies 8 bytes in memory, and the long double data type, which occupies 12 bytes in memory. But you will often use the flow type. Now let's see how to store a character in memory. But before, you have to know what is the ASCII code. As I told you in the introduction, everything in computer is represented by ones and zeros. So it's the same thing for characters. This is why we need a code to know how is each character represented in the machine. And one of the first used codes is the ASCII code. ASCII stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And this code contains 128 characters. It contains the digits from 0 to 9, the lowercase characters, the uppercase characters, the punctuation characters, and some control codes like the carriage return. So in general, to store a character in memory, we use the char data type, which occupies only one byte in the memory. So we can put values between minus 128 to 127, and the value represents the ASCII code of that character. Not a problem if you didn't understand, don't get confused because we will see how to declare and initialize the variable in the next video, see you there. Too much theory, let's now create some variables. First let's see the syntax. To declare and define a variable, first we have to precise the data type, then the variable name, then a semicolon, that's it. Let's see an example, let's create a variable named var of type int. So we have to write the data type first, which is int, then the variable name which is var, then the semicolon obviously. So what happened here? We just allocated 4 bytes in the memory, where we can store an integer. Let's see a second example. Let's declare a variable of type char. So we write char, then we write the name of the variable, for example ch, so now we got another variable in our program. Okay, now we got two variables, but what can we do with them? This is what we're gonna see now. 
First, we can initialize the variable. We can give a first value to it that we will be able to change later. For example, we can decide to store the value 10 in the first variable we created. For that, when declaring the variable, name must be followed by an equal side followed by the value we want to assign, 10 in this case. So, by this instruction, the value of our variable is now 10. We can also declare multiple variables in the same line, but they must be of the same data type, and separated by a comma with a semicolon at the end. Let's for example declare three float variables a, b, c in the same line. We can initialize if we want. So we write float, which is the data type, then the first variable that we named a, let's initialize it for example to 4.5, then a comma, then the second variable b, we can choose to not initialize it, then another comma, then the third variable c, let's initialize it to minus 3.65, and now a semicolon to end the instruction. Okay, now we initialize the variable, but it doesn't mean that it is final value. We can change it later in the program. For example, we initialized a at 4.5, but we can decide now, for example, to set its value to 5.2. No problem with that. And we can change it again as many times as we want. Okay, now we learned how to initialize a variable. What can we do more? We can for example print it, we can use it to count something, we can store the value of a result in it, and many other useful things. This is why variables are very important in programming and we can't do much without it. So in next videos we will learn how to do more interesting things with variables. See you in the next video to talk about constants. Welcome to this video where we will talk about constants. So what is a constant? In the precedent video, we said that we can change the value of a variable after initializing it. But we can make a constant instead of a variable if we decide to not modify its value once initialized. So if we make a constant, if we try to change its value after the initialization, we will get an error. Let's dive into it now. The syntax is very easy. It's the same as for variables, but we have to add the const keyword at the beginning. So we have const then the data type, then the name, then the initial value, then the final semicolon. And this time we must directly initialize the constant. If we try to do it later we will get an error. So let's see an example. For example, let's suppose you're making a game where the number of players will always be 4, so it won't change during the whole program. Then we can use a constant named number of players initialized to 4. I'll tell you why I wrote everything in uppercase in the next video. Last thing that I want to show you about constants is that they can also be useful to avoid using insignificant numbers. For example, we know that in most countries the majority age is 18. And let's suppose that in your program you want that something happens when the user age is under 18. You would write, if user age is smaller than 18, but if you read your code again after some time, you may not remember why you use the number 18. So for that, it's better to use a constant variable named majority age initialized to 18, instead of directly writing 18. And now, let's move to variable naming rules. See you in the next video. Welcome to this video where we will see the variable naming rules. Because there is some rules while naming a variable. First, a variable name must begin with a letter or an underscore. This is an underscore. So, it can't begin with a number or another character, either a letter or an underscore, that's it. Rule number two, after the first letter, you can use a number if you want. So you can use a number or letter or an underscore, that's it. Rule number three, you have to know that variables names are case sensitive. It means that using a lowercase letter isn't the same as using an uppercase letter. So these three variables are all different. Last rule, your variable name shouldn't be a keyword, we've talked about it in the precedent chapter. So if you're using car blocks and your variable became blue, so it's a keyword. And now, let me show you a naming convention that you can use. As you know, we can't use a space character in a variable name. So to join between the words and get a readable name, there is naming conventions. The most used one is the camel case. For example, we have a variable named the user jumps count. But as said earlier, we can't use spaces, so the camel case convention is to join the words and to capitalize the first letter of each word except the first one. 
So in this case, we would write it like this. We have other naming conventions like the snake case, where we put an underscore between each word instead of a space. It's as you want. We have also naming conventions for other programming elements like the constant. In the last video, I wrote the constant names with only uppercase letter and underscores between each two words, because this is the convention to name a constant. All letters are uppercase and an underscore between each two words. You're not obliged to use it, but it's better to do. So, see you in the next video to talk about enum and typedef. See you there.